So, um, we can get started. So, thank you for, for joining us for the Hometown Virtual Challenge. Let's go global together. Join instructors, instructors and our new generation of students, learners, uh, leaders, I'm sorry, uh, engaging conversations around SDGs in response to food insecurity during the pandemic. Um, I would like to present to you Hope Windle, Robert Hellstrom, Penny Orton, and Duku Skela. Uh, so um, I leave you with the presentation. Thank you. Everybody. Yeah, I'm sorry, Hope. It seems you have some kind of feedback. Okay. Oh, oh can you can you share your um, your screen and then maybe I'll try to do the audio <laughs> and and penny maybe you can help out too <laughs> um I can't, I can't share my I'm sorry, I'm sorry. 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 Yeah, yeah, we can kind of hear you, but it's very echoey. Yes, you can you can still um, turn off your your microphone and share your screen, um, and someone else can can speak. Or if you would like, you can send me the presentation and I'll share it. Let me let me try to share. Hold on. Um, my apologies. I'm on a, a computer in the classroom, so I uh, I will now. Uh, try to share what we have on Google Drive. Um, so let me uh, go ahead. 
And let's see, I just don't want to share everything there, but um, let's go. Okay, can everybody see this? Yes. Okay. So, I suppose, welcome everyone. Um, my name is Rob Pellstrom. I am uh, from Bridgewater State University in uh, Massachusetts in the United States. And I'd like to just go around here and, and uh, have everybody uh, introduce themselves if you're here. Um, so we can start with the U.S. here, uh, Meg. I'll tell you what, I'll just introduce everybody. Uh, so Meg uh, Riley is um, the director of the Seoul Homestead Education Center, which is a, um, a small scale farm located in Southeast Massachusetts that does a lot of outreach in uh, educating uh, our younger generation about farming practices, uh, and particularly um, sustainable ones. Hope, who is having some sound difficulties, is uh, from SUNY in uh, New York State. And um, she is the COIL Community Development Leader. Elliot uh, is from Durban University of Technology in South Africa, and he'll be joining us. And Dudu is a senior lecturer at Durban University of Technology in South Africa. Penny is the COIL specialist in Durban University. Um, Alfonso Fernandez he is from uh, Chile uh, and at the University of Concepcion and will help uh, give us some insights onto, uh, onto farming practices in Chile. And uh, we'll move on to the next screen here. So we're gonna take uh, some time to introduce COIL. So I'm hoping maybe uh, uh, Penny can or somebody can speak to this. seeing the uh, collaborative online international learning is COIL and um, employ, uh, employers value global awareness, collaboration, and cross-cultural skills. Uh, but there are several obstacles uh, to participate in the study abroad, uh, such as finances and mobility. Uh, whereas COIL modules um, provide a cross-cultural experience without leaving your home. And so it's really uh, good for these times where we're kind of stuck uh, with, with COVID restrictions. Um, it's rooted in academic courses uh, and discussions. And uh, you can see here uh, the process by which COIL uh, lives by. Uh, team building, discussion, project, and then concluding phases. And the methodology here where um, we're actually having collaboration occur between course A and course X, which could be across in a different country. Um, and this COIL approach allows for that to happen. Uh, and it's uh, 
also showing here is the institutional initiatives by which COIL is, um, is kind of created, um, including uh, active pedagogy, diversity and inclusion, global learning in the curriculum, uh, 21st century skills, which are sought after by employers, um, high impact practices, etc. So you kind of see the, the COIL approach of connecting people around the world uh, through connecting students in courses. Um, we also uh, have uh, Professor Elliot McTini and Dr. Uh, Penny Orton and... Um, Try talking now, Penny. Hi, can you hear me okay. now? Okay, thank you, Penny. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sorry, I left and I came back because I cannot find a refresh screen or anything like that. So just very quickly. Um, I don't know if you want me to talk a bit more about COIL or just move on. No, let's move on. Okay. And can you hear me too? And Rob, yes. can you click on present top right, the, the present button, so we can see this mm. more full screen? Yeah, yeah. great. Yeah, so um, uh, Mr. Elliot Makatini is going to speak uh, to a um, small session on a small section on food gardening and gardening in the context of South Africa. Food gardening in the context of South Africa. Move to the next screen. Great, thanks. Um, Alvin, are you able to bring my student in? She's in the conference, but not in this group. Elliot, are you? She's in another. Ben? So um, you just click on share my my video, and I will let him in. I mean, he has to. To, to click on share and I'll let him in. Elliot, are you able to, are you here? Can you speak? Okay, so I, I'll talk then on behalf of, of Elliot. I won't give you as interesting a discussion as he would have, but um, food gardens in South Africa have always been a very important um, aspect of life and in South Africa. And there's quite a lot of socio-historical, economic, political, and cultural context to this. So historically, people grew food gardens. Um, people used to, they were not uh, hungry because they grew their own food and children were socialized into growing food, working in the garden, and it was part of, of you know, everybody's home life. However, this has been eroded through um, political, um, the, the political context in South Africa through apartheid um, and through activism and uh, sort of uh, students being politicized and used for other um, political um, ends and so they saw food gardening as a little bit sort of uh, not very the right thing to do it was better to go and buy food and as a result of that um, there's not this culture of of growing their own food in young people and however they and this um, politicization, the unemployment that we have in our country, um, the extreme poverty, we've got one of the highest co uh, Gini coefficients in the world. Um, this has led to a lot of social pathologies in amongst youth particularly, and which has also moved them away from traditionally using um, home food gardens. However, there is a renewed interest in growing and selling vegetables and herbs, particularly now um, with the pandemic um, and people being at home and a lot more food insecurity. So there is some interest and there's many uh, initiatives in in terms of urban food gardens and also um, encouraging people in rural areas 
to grow their own food or grow a lot of their own food on the land that they have. However, the land issue is also a very contested area in our country. Um, there is an initiative from the government called One Home, One Garden, and that's launched. Um, it's been going for many years, but not that actively. And there's some, with this renewed interest in growing and selling vegetables and herbs, um, this program is being um, re-energized. Thank you. Good. Okay. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Dudu Sokela from the Deben University of Technology. Um, we had a collaboration on a nutrition project. It was the Deben University of Technology nursing students and uh, the SUNY Ulster nutrition students. Uh, the challenge was a capstone project where nursing students identified a malnourished child in a nurse-led clinic. Malnutrition of children below the age of five years is common in South Africa. The government has proposed interventions to try and mitigate the malnutrition, such as exclusive breastfeeding from birth to six months, without giving anything else except for prescribed medication. This began as a way of preventing transmission of HIV from mother to child and has since been extended to all mothers, irrespective of their HIV status. Another intervention, as has been mentioned by Dr. Otten, was a one home, one garden, which means that every house, even if you don't have a big space, you can have a garden as big as a door to grow your own vegetables. Another intervention was that staple foods such as maize and flour are fortified with vitamins, particularly vitamin A, to provide micronutrients to children. So the South African students, once they've identified this malnourished child, they visited the family to do a, a, a situational analysis of the whole family to assist them and to check on how this child can be assisted with good nutrition. This included budgeting, uh, how to cook, cook food well, and also planting uh, vegetable gardens. So the activity was for South African students to share information about the child and the family with the SUNY Alstar nutrition students. They collaborated on the nutrition approaches for the child and the family using guidelines and what was nutrition guidelines and what was culturally available. Diverse food and nutrition solutions were explored uh, to assist the family to feed the child. Um, I was hoping that my student is going, was going to present on this, but She's in another room in the conference. I don't know how we can get her into this room. Uh, but the students learned a lot uh, on, on global learning because they were in class with the students overseas. So they had that experience. They also experienced multicultures from the, the, the Sunni Alsa students. And also because they exchanged information, they exchanged nutritional guidelines. Um, one of the examples was when the Sunni Alstar students uh, recommended kale. And the South African students didn't know what kale was. They know spinach. And also mealy meal, or I think it's like corn meal. It's a staple food in South Africa, which is eaten by everyone all the time. The Sunni Asa students didn't know what um, Mili Mil was. So there was a lot of transcultural exchange and understanding of diverse cultures, diverse food and nutrition. Um, that is where I'm going to end my uh, presentation. I will hand over to Robert. Thank you, Dudu. Uh, that was wonderful. Uh, I want to just introduce uh, my team here from uh, Massachusetts and then 
also uh, Alfonso Fernandez in Chile. Um, we're working on a, a group, a team effort to try to connect uh, students with each other at different universities um, and uh, looking at community resilience uh, to climate change and um, some of the extremes associated with climate change. Mm -hmm. And so in the, uh, the upper left here is an image of some of my students from the university setting up instrumentation at the Seoul Homestead uh, Education Center and Farm uh, to try to monitor uh, the soil conditions uh, and the weather conditions uh, over time so that we can get a better connection between the science of how to study climate and the perceptions of farmers. And um, I, I want to hand it over uh, to uh, Meg Riley, who is the director of the Seoul Homestead Education Center, to, to just speak to some of what she's been doing. Oh, there she is. Do you, do you all see Meg? She's here, she's muted. Yes, can she mute? Hi, Meg, can you hear us? She's muted. Okay, so how might we unmute? Um, we Alan, can you unmute? Megan Riley. It seems that that's a problem um, to unmute. The only way I got myself unmuted was I left the and thing and I in. rejoined. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, let me describe what Meg does <laughs> uh, just for now uh, until maybe we could get in touch with her to rejoin. Um, or could Alfonso go? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Alfonso uh, is also uh, one of my collaborators in Chile, and um, he, he will talk about some of the challenges of the eucalyptus uh, plantations in Chile. So, Alfonso, go ahead. Can, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, good. That's good. So, well, thank you for, for inviting me to this. And uh, I'm, it's... Um, Basically, what happens in, in the area of Chile where I live is there have been decades of replacement of natural forests for for eucalyptus or another species that are not so good for keeping water on the soil, and that comes from a from a law which was a reaction to environment, environmental problems from two three hundred years related to erosion. So the, the best option was to re, reforest with the exotic uh, trees that are actually um, eucalyptus and pine. But in the in the in the in the long term, those trees created a, a exacerbated uh, scenarios of drought that drought as we have right now in this in this area. So what you can see there in, in the slide, particularly in the center. It's an experimental analysis of the last 10, 15 years of restoration of previously covered, of previous areas previously covered with eucalyptus. Now are again recovered with native forest. And what you see in the end, at the end to the, of, of the plot towards your right, is the way that uh, soils be, uh, become very resilient to scenarios of drought. We're still in a drought, but areas with native forests uh, tend to be more resilient and they to keep more water. So that means that um, having those areas can improve what's been going on with this change in land cover, particularly um, the timber industry taking uh, areas of agriculture uh, where, uh, in, in the region and areas of native forests. So what you basically the, the message here is sometimes what we do in a in a certain environment in terms of keeping certain 
certain processes to not ha to not happen in light erosion. If we do with the wrong tools, they may become uh, the, the wrong solution. So the best solution now here is just keep native forests, do um, mindful agriculture here, and not uh, using uh, not having a so widespread uh, timber plantation uh, in the region. All right. Um, yeah. Well, thank you very much for that, Alfonso. Um, I don't, uh, we're probably not going to get Meg on board, uh, at least not at this point. But I will say that uh, she does some tremendous work with, um, as you can see in the upper right corner of the slide, uh, younger students uh, from uh, elementary schools. Um, and they actually volunteer as well at the farm to help and really get engaged in the process of working the soil and learning the importance of growing uh, our own food, uh, nutrient rich food. And, um, and she runs uh, daily, uh, uh, tirelessly, these education programs and helps also to run the farm, which, which has about 20 um, small scale farmers who volunteer uh, their own time to grow, to grow food there. So I thank you um, for all the uh, presentations, our introductions. Um, we also have a student of um, duties who's here with us. Um, if she can unmute. All right, maybe we should keep going. Elliot, do you want to say anything about? Okay. All right, but uh, I suppose I can move on. Um, so what, what we want to do today is an activity with the audience that involves a, um, a Jamboard using uh, Google. And uh, you can see the link up here um, that we're going to share in our, in our chat. Um, let me go back here. Uh, but uh, I need to access uh, this real quick here. Hold on. Um, Shall I talk about that while you're busy with getting the it. link? Go for it. The thing okay. Is, yep. So, so I'm I'm Penny, which uh, you've met already. I'm um, from the International Education and Partnerships Directorate at Durban University of Technology. And um, as Rob said, we're going to use the Google Jamboard for an activity. We'll use the reverse brainstorming technique to um, think about some factors related to zero hunger. Reverse brainstorming comes out of design-based thinking and is a technique to help us find solutions to difficult problems. So instead of asking, how do I solve this problem, you reverse it and ask, how could you make the problem worse? Once you've done that, you reverse those worse situations into solutions. So we're going to um, have up the Jamboard. Um, and if you can all click on the link that you should find in the chat, um, and then that will bring up the Jamboard on your own screen, on your own computer, but it will be real time. So you can um, start to add your thoughts. Um, sorry. So I, I could share the screen as well, I suppose. But um, let me, uh, let's try this. Uh, oh, there. Is that good? Yep. 
So okay. what we'd like um, you from the participants to do is to try out the um, Jamboard quickly. If you've, if you've used it before, that's great. If you haven't, um, then what we'd like you to do, you'll see on the extreme left-hand side, um, there's the directions. So you click on one of the sticky notes on the left-hand side and type your name on it. Um, and then you can look to the top center to move the next page, but um, let's we'll take you through that. So if you want to just add your name in the meantime, that would be great. You can change the color, you can move the pieces around. Um, yeah, so. Let's go to the next screen, Penny. Okay, let, let me introduce uh, our first Jamboard session. Again, we're gonna go with this reverse brainstorm approach uh, and uh, the first topic is climate change is a factor of food insecurity. And what we'd like for you all to put in is how can climate change make your hometown or your household less food secure? What is your community doing to become less food secure? So it's the reverse of fixing the problem. We want to cause the problem here. So please feel free to, to grab post-its or sticky notes to the left and add your comments. And you get to this page by the top of the screen. Right up here. Um, yeah, the arrow moves you forward. Yeah. So maybe while people are thinking of um, items to put in the post-it in the reverse brainstorm, um, Meg, have you been able to unmute yet? No. Oh, an excellent, excellent uh, note there. Yep. So we'll take a, another minute here in light of our time, um, and then we'll move on. Excellent. Beautiful. These are great. These are fantastic ideas. I'm going to move on um, soon here. You can, you can keep jamming away on this particular jam board. But in light of time, we're going to get some more reverse uh, brainstorming here. And I don't know, Penny, do you want to mention this one or introduce? 
Yeah, I can. Thank so you. now that you have um, thought about how to worsen the problem of um, food security and uh, climate change, etc. Now you're going to reverse that thinking and think about how we can become more resilient to climate change and make your hometown and or your household more food secure. So taking some of those fabulous ideas from the first page and reversing those now into um, solutions um, to some of those, those uh, you know, worsening conditions. Um, so the reverse brainstorming is really a nice technique that enables people to be quite creative, if you like, to use it in a, in a classroom or in your COIL project. Um, you could use it as an icebreaker for students in a COIL project, um, or you could use it as a way for students to brainstorm how, um, how to, to tackle some of these um, wicked problems that are global problems, but are, we have a local context to them. Um, so we all, uh, throughout the world, food insecurity um, is a problem. Uh, climate change is affecting all of us. And um, so how can students can collaborate um, through a COIL project on, on finding some solutions? And yes, we want solutions in our local context, but sometimes these global problems and through the interaction, it piques our imagination when we collaborate with other students uh, from other countries in the world. And perhaps something that's worked in Chile might also be applicable in South Africa or um, in the United States or in Mexico or, you know, so um, this is the, the strength of a COIL project. And this is just one technique um, that you might like to bring into the classroom to make it quite interactive. Well, these are great. Mm. Provide free breakfast and lunch to all school students. I love it. Here we have some drawing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Joe, do you want to say anything or anyone? Uh, yep, uh, Sitabili, Elliot, have you got some students there with you who might like to add something? I saw them, but I, I don't know whether they are still there. I heard in the ANC manifesto last night that they're going to promote food gardens on the pavements. How about that? Yep. Fabulous idea. And people walking past can just help themselves to a bit of some That's leaves or fruit or, you know, some spinach leaves or a cabbage or whatever you grow on your garden, on your, on your pavement or sidewalk. Beautiful. Well, these are great uh, solutions here. I, uh, I'm, uh, I, I see a lot of diverse ideas, and um, we're talking about water grabs. Yeah, disallow corporate water grabs and um, the credits that companies get. Uh, sometimes we forget about. Yeah, and the, this one of the do not till or turn the soil too much. Let the organisms break down the organic matter. Yeah. That's lovely as well. Fabulous idea. So because we have a minute left, I just want to thank everyone. And here is your turn to think about how you could use this kind of reverse brainstorm to sort of unstick um, your thinking in terms of teaching SDGs, perhaps not feeling that you have um, time to do something like this. And um, but actually what you can do is 
um, everyone can do this. And um, the, these are some great examples of how ways that you can um, a, attain your goals that you're trying to ascribe to with your curriculum design, but also be able to do a project where students feel that they are contributing and thinking larger than just for the class, but for um, all of us, as we have witnessed with the wonderful leaders that have spoken today. So even though we had a lot of technical challenges today, I really appreciate so much work that everyone on this team has put in to making their projects go well and then also to make this presentation go as well as it could be. Um, so thank you for joining us today. And thank you to Dudu and Elliot and Megan and Alfonso and Sibile and Penny and Robert and our moderator, Louise. Louise, thank you very and much. You, and you hope. <laughs> thank you, hope. Yeah, thank you for all the amazing projects. Uh, I know we had some technical difficulties, but I really love the projects and I really love also the approach of, you know, making the problem worse in order to uh, reverse engineering, reverse engineer and um, in order to have a sense of what is the problem, what is the cause of the problem and try to solve it. Uh, you know, by exacerbating the, the problem. <laughs> so yes, it's a very nice approach that I myself, I am gonna use it in my classes. So thank you all for sharing that, that approach. And thank you all for tuning in. Thanks for all the, all the, um, all the projects that you are doing, uh, you know, and making, making Earth a better place. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So I invite you all to to continue here at EGC conference. Um, you can go to reception. There is uh, there's the all the the stage or the presentations that are going on so please uh, go to reception there you will have all the calendar and all the events thank you i'm glad people are putting their emails in the chat and um, mm -hmm. um Sibile, if you can put your email in the chat, let's reach out to you and we'll do a video of just you and to hear from you and all of the people in our great panel. So um, this is not all for lost. And um, so thank you all. Um, people are really appreciative of all that you have done to make this work. Yes, we can post a video of your projects in the UGC um, site. And that is very, very interesting also to, to, to see all the videos and to collaborate, right? For all of us to collaborate. Thank you very much. That was so nice Thanks. to see everybody again. <laughs> yeah. Being Thanks. And yep. So sorry, everybody. Bye-bye. So thank you very much, everybody. This okay. yeah. is like a coil project, definitely. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh, thanks. Bye. Bye-bye.